it was a, a moment in time between World War I and World War II where lots of innovations in materials had taken place or were taking place. Uh, with the, uh, the advent of Formica and various tiling that was available and all kinds of materials that were made out of plastic and celluloid and all kinds of things that made these times unique times for designers because they now had opportunities in which they could use materials that had never been available before but it, it put a tremendous amount of emphasis on design as opposed to uh, expensive materials. Because by and large, these new materials were inexpensive and they were designed to be a choice for people that couldn't afford to have, say, marble countertops, or they couldn't have uh, very expensive wood that would be used in their furnishings. So uh, what we have to do is backtrack just a little bit and uh, make this distinction between Art Nouveau and Art Deco, which we talked about just, uh, just maybe a week or two ago. And there was uh, a lot of emphasis in the Art Nouveau period, which had to do with uh, emphasis on manual labor. At this time in history, when Art Nouveau was popular, 1890 to 1914, labor costs were relatively inexpensive, whereas the materials were those things that were the costly parts of putting together something. So um, what happens during World War I and World War II is that designers and architects and various people working in these fields are going to begin to use materials that are not only less expensive, less labor intensive, but they were going to be machine made. So though uh, artists are almost always inspired by nature, and you can see what is happening here with these sinewy shapes and, and, and references to nature everywhere, here you also see the same thing or similar things going on, but this is done in a geometric way because making straight lines and having things punch pressed and machine made are less labor intensive less material waste if you're doing things in a straight line, if you're making the, the, the object in a straight line. So these are some of the examples of what happens during this Art Deco period. Uh, this could be black marble that is sliced thin, that is just done as a decorative facade, or it could be something like Bakelite, something that's very, very strong plastic that can be used on exterior walls and also, uh, we see that there are lots of elements here that add elements of richness to it with these metals that are shiny and reflect the sun and that are polished to a high gloss so that people have the sensation that they're going into a new style temple, clearly, but it is one that has the design elements that make it look rich as opposed to expensive materials. So another thing that becomes very important at this time that becomes kind of a new venue for, for uh, architects and structural engineers and people working in these areas in which they make decorative elements everywhere is that if you can punch press or you can make these kind of objects with machines and rectangular shapes, then you uh, design a building according to the math of this whole uh, design. You're going to put three pieces here, four pieces there, whatever it is that you're going to do. But this is the way that the building comes together. It's just a big box, but the repeat patterns are what make it attractive and what become kind of the tools for the way that the building will look. Now, this is in high contrast to what we saw during the Art Nouveau period. And we talked about this man, Siegfried Bing, whose family was interested in promoting the arts as they themselves owned a ceramics factory. He was a man that became completely enamored in all things Japanese. He had a little Japanese house built behind his home so that they could have tea, tea parties. And his gallery, La Nouveau, is where we get the name for that period, 1890 to 1914. 
and it is in many ways an introduction to the Western world as to how, how the Eastern world makes art and how it furnishes its interiors. So we saw that the way that the Japanese world made art, they were focused on nature, which went hand in hand with what the American world was interested in doing. And also, and in the European world as well, this focus on nature that we talked about called romanticism, which was known as the deification of nature as opposed to strict, uh, say, biblical teachings. And we know that this Japanism was pervasive in the West. And we see it very often in the works of Vincent van Gogh because this is the time period in which he was working. So the two dimensionality that came from Art Nouveau uh, kind of put together with the innovations that were taking place with the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist period eventually help us see that there's a different kind of dimensionality that's taking place in the art world. It becomes two-dimensional. And because it becomes two-dimensional, we know that down the road, all abstract art will typically be two-dimensional. Now here, what we see is that the Western world was so taken by all of these things take, that were coming in from the Orient that we began to absorb the, the beautiful objects that we could purchase and mix them with maybe more traditional things that Americans or Europeans would have had in their homes. But this attention to nature and this moment in history where more people have more money to spend on luxury items brings about this, this interest not only in nature, but in making objects that are nature inspired so that people's homes become more like a sanctuary that is reminiscent of the nature that is being lost out of doors because downtown centers are being gobbled up by factory systems and people are living further away from nature because the farms are further away from the cities. So what happens here is that the Art Nouveau period answers a need as almost all art almost always answers a need. And what is the need? If you can't go to nature, then architects and designers will bring nature to you. Now, another thing that we discussed a few of this few times when we talked about Art Nouveau was that when the city becomes more anonymous and more and more people are living in city centers, they need protection. And consequently, these kind of security doors were still carrying out these same ideas, nature inspired, but structural work that is necessary. And these were the kind of designs that were made by Hector Guimard. And Hector Guimard is known for this Art Nouveau or style metro that became part of this entryway to the metro system that was created in Paris around the 1890s. So these kind of shapes that are structural in nature have the inspiration of these motifs that would come from the natural world, but there were others that were making uh, Art Nouveau design at this time that were veering closer to Art Deco. And this was the part of Art Nouveau that came to be known as geometric the geometric response to Art Nouveau. It wasn't just sinewy, but it was simplistic and geometric. Now, we will come back to this in just a few moments, but I have to mention one more thing that's very important, is that when Richard Wagner was writing and, and designing the stage sets and costuming and doing, you know, writing the libretto and the composition, he came up with a phrase that has been used forever since that time. Actually, I don't think he devised it necessarily himself, but he certainly applied it to uh, the way that he made art since he did everything and his design was all encompassing, whether it was music, libretto, etc. then he began to refer to it as an all-encompassing artwork which in German is called Gesamtkunstwerk, from the word zusammen, together, a, a Gesamtkunstwerk. 
well, this kind of idea that everything should be inclusive and fit together is what some of the architects began to apply to their designs. Well, they wanted to make the kind of work in which you walk into the building, you're practically walking through a little forest glen. And when you go, say, from story to story, you're still connected with this feeling of moving through nature. And you also live in nature because the furniture design has the same continuity. It's an all-encompassing work. We said also that Art Nouveau went all over the world and had different names, whether it was the uh, modernism in Spain or the modern Polish style or the modern Russian style, or even say in the Italian world, it was known as the Liberty style. Now, the reason that Art Nouveau was embraced readily was because it was a way of putting up large buildings that could avoid being boring by using the simple elements of say or simpler elements of say paint and mosaic work and this kind of decoration just with a little bit of decoration that is made with more expensive bronze which you can contrast with all the labor hours and that is required to put up a building like this but the secession building or this young style, the Jungenstil, became a dominant force in change. And I'm going to talk about this extensively this Friday with the Wittgenstein family, because the Wittgenstein family paid for this new art museum, and they were uh, patrons of the new artists that were coming up at this period, like Gustav Klimt. Now, what happens in the Viennese world and why they in particular wanted to put up these kind of buildings, we'll see in just a moment, but it is unquestionably the first modern art museum in which there was a large skylight under this protective design. It was made during the Art Nouveau period and it is the geometric style and heavily geometric. In fact, it looks a little bit like a, it could serve as a prison, quite frankly. But one of the reasons that it's designed in this way is so that on the other side of this, you have walls that you can display art on and you have a lot of natural light that will be coming into this space. And one of the ways that we can appreciate modern art at its fullest is with um, natural light that comes in from the outside. Whereas, as you know, if you go to museums like the Ringling Museums, it tends to be dark for various reasons. But we know that modern art, one of the big reasons we want to see all of it is that the brushstroke becomes a big part of the story that is being told in modern art. So you must be able to see it well. Well, in any case, what we have is we have an architect that designs this kind of building and they wanted to secede. This is why they call themselves the secession movement. They wanted to secede from traditional architecture that looked like the, the Greek and Roman Parthenon and Pantheon. And it made a huge impact on the architecture world. That is the reason, sort of in very short order, when uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designs one of his first commercial uh, buildings, he designs this church in Oak Park, Illinois, that is very much reminiscent of what we see here very, very large, distinctive shapes, heavy, very heavy. But at the same time, when you walk into this church, it has a lot of light that's coming in from all around, a lot of natural light, and it feels like a spiritual and uh, an elevated space because of its simple design. You're paying attention, attention much more, say, to the minister's sermon or by being uh, more... Uh, having sort of an internal relationship that you're having with what is that being said rather than paying attention to a lot of ornamentation which would be more typical of uh, classical style churches. Well Frank Lloyd Wright was working at a time when the secession building was uh, such an imposing new way to make art uh, or to make architectural design and make art consequently as a result of it 
is that you can see that his buildings are going to take quite a long time before it's more and more refined and until we start to get the kind of designs that we saw in the Roby house. But one last thing I wanted to mention, because this is going to have a big correlation with what we're going to say toward the end of this lecture. We also looked at uh, uh, an Art Nouveau capital, which happens to be Riga, Latvia, where we were looking at this piece of, um, of a building that is part of this romantic neoclassical um, Art Nouveau response where we saw these kind of this correlation between where we saw a woman that looked somewhat like a warrior with her hairstyle. At the same time, we now have a more dominant warrior here. Now, again, art is always a response to what is going on. Uh, here, the woman looks a little bit, say, more mellow uh, or just pensive, perhaps, whereas here she certainly looks determined. And then we saw all of those other aspects of having the, um, the peacock next to her and the gargoyle, which, which is referencing the ancient way that architecture was designed. Uh, architecture uh, is, is always inspired by the ancient world. And so we saw that this is another side of this same building where we saw women holding up an, a, an Olymp Olympic wreath which was given to the winner of, the, of an Olympics match, and we saw that she was pregnant with new ideas. This association as well with, with the gargoyles and all these, these aspects of what came as precursors to this building was a very determined Statue of Liberty. And also we saw that these gargoyles then would be from the uh, famous Notre Dame Cathedral and other cathedrals of its kind. What, what we see that is happening here is she might be actually a little bit closer to um, what we would see as a determined face of a woman in the art uh, deco period. However, we know that lots and lots of changes are taking place. Uh, in this instance, also, just one last thing is we see that she has a peacock by her because we knew that the goddess Hera, uh, probably one of the most powerful goddesses uh, on Mount Olympus, always has this peacock with her. And so consequently, we see that is happening here. Now, this sends an important message. This sends a message that this woman, as determined as she is, this, this soldier woman that is looking toward, uh, looking sternly toward a future that she perhaps wants to dominate in more than years before, we also make this reference that she is already a goddess. She's already a goddess in the same way that this is this uh, icon of a goddess. Well, we know that women's roles in society were changing dramatically. And one of the things that happens during industrialization is that more women can support themselves and they don't necessarily have to marry to survive. And if that is the case, as women become more wealthy, as they go into businesses for themselves, as they do whatever aspect of business that meets the market, they are going to want to determine their own fate. So they will start marching uh, for the kind of future that they want. And by the way, the suffragettes were very instrumental in making abstract art a viable um, business in the United States. We'll talk about that in future lectures, but they were very interested in how art can generate new ideas and thought that can, and in particular abstract art, because it can break away from any old ideas that had been present for centuries, if not thousands of years. Now, another thing that we have to mention that is very important is that around the 1890s, uh, this too, I will discuss, as I said, this Friday, what, what happened that was so significant was that Vienna, which had been a fortress city for hundreds of years, the, the area that was at one time the fortress walls were taken down 
when Franz Joseph, who was the emperor here, wanted to make an important statement about what his um, uh, empire will look like, is he wanted to let his people know that were living outside the fortification walls that they would be included in uh, the decisions that were going to determine their fate in laws and in a culture. Well, this became known as the Ring Road because this, this three mile long fortification wall came down. And when that fortification wall came down, it was empty space. So one of the ways that Franz Joseph wanted to bring his culture in together was, uh, was through cultural events. And these very expensive buildings went up in, uh, on the Ring Road, on that Ringstrasse. And they were considered to be among the most beautiful buildings that had been built for centuries. And they were built, some of them in the Baroque style and some of the classical style and, and even Gothic. But what happened here is that Vienna, because they were spending so much money to make these kind of changes happen here, there were lots of people that were architects and designers and artists and authors. Vienna became a huge city that was equal to Paris in the cultural explosion that was taking place here. Now these kind of buildings can only be paid for by a king or an emperor. These uh, buildings that are built at this time when labor costs are going up and where materials are going up and everything is going up, all of the detail, all of the work that is done to make these kind of um, distinguished, highly regarded, uh, memorable moments in history, architecturally in every other way, can only be paid for by a king's coffer. Now, there were many thousands, if not millions of people that were coming here that needed accommodation. So the practical way to create accommodation that has some attract attractive elements to it, but very practical elements are the kind of buildings that are going to start to go up at this time, which are called Art Nouveau geometric style, as we said, and very simple. And then the other thing that is going to be adopted here that has never been done before is concrete, is going to be used to put up buildings. Uh, never mind that concrete is obviously very much less expensive than other materials or individual bricks and all of these kinds of things. Uh, one of the ways that you can make a building like this attractive is to make the front or the street level very attractive. And uh, then when you go into the building, which is probably the foyer for these apartments, you will have to really make this attractive because uh, this tells you what is the personality of the building. People that would live in a more simplified design like this still have to be sold that they're, you're walking into an elegant space. And here are the apartments and the and future uh, skyscrapers are going to be just shells, but what we see is the attractive aspect of all this is going to have to be at the street level where the observer will see it readily. Now, this 1910 period where you start to see this kind of streamlined look and this kind of minimalistic look is uh, already being fed by the ideas that have been born in the Vienna workshop. The Vienna workshop was made up of principals that were interested in turning out all kinds of objects for the home that can be machine tooled or some of the work can be done by machines and consequently simplifying life can create interiors that are elegant. But these, uh, these simplified lines can be made more attractive with uh, uh, with with uh, various metals that can be used here to decorate chairs as opposed to say expensive uh, uh, tufted chairs, expensive uh, fabrics of all kinds. <laughs> and, then, and then of course the light, the light that will be brought in here. Uh, wh whoever is not muted, would you please be kind enough to mute, to mute yourself? 
So now, uh, and just to be sure that this, okay. Now, so what, let me, let me just be sure and do that so that we can um, get the most out of this. Okay, so now, and I promise you that I will unmute you at the end. This is a very different kind of design. People had not seen this kind of look because most people's lives were dominated by these kinds of heavy looks. And uh, th this home was very quickly forgotten when there were options to have a more simplified style. And this is the kind of work that came from the Vienna workshop. Uh, which also permits a lot of light in, and there's a lot of colors that would be used at this time, primarily beiges, sometimes light yellows and whites, which would revive everything and make your um, even participation in a kitchen lighthearted because everything is not heavy and dark. But this too did not happen in a vacuum. This came, uh, in, in many cases, you can trace it, to the Willow Tea Rooms in Scotland, which were designed by uh, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. And Charles Rennie Mackintosh was interested in the Art Nouveau geometric style. He was also influenced by Aubrey Beardsley, which some of you might know, an illustrator that did, did these kind of elongated shapes but everything was simplified and just absolutely heaven. And uh, so we know that Charles Rennie McIntosh got a lot of press for his designs and not for nothing do we see that Frank Lloyd Wright adopts them as well. Still, this 1907 period in which we are introduced to Picasso's and Brock's Cubist works is one of the reasons that we also see this at the very same time. So the simplification of style, the simplification of thinking, and uh, one of the things that you have to realize that these kinds of work represent is the creativity of the human mind. This in many ways, if you can make representations of things that do not exist in reality, you can perhaps even make them a reality, but it's a way of celebrating the creative mind. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright was a man that was interested in changing his style because he, to him, the classical style was an absolute affront. So there is a lecture just on Frank Lloyd Wright because his uh, contributions cannot be denied. And he was one of the most important architects that ever lived because he changed the way that most people live in the world. Typically, we live in a ranch style house or often we, we would prefer to live in a ranch style house because of this openness scenario that was developed primarily by him. But what we see that is happening here, though this is geometric, it still has elements of warmth there, which are obvious because of the use of the brownish autumnal um, shades of, 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 of browns and beiges, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright loved the colors of autumn anyway in his designs because it was a restful season and he thought it, it was a way to create a home as a sanctuary. So we're saying this because in contrast to the warmth, what happens with the founding of the Bauhaus is they will be much more interested in embracing the machine and consequently their building, which you can see here, is glass, steel, and concrete. This too was one of the foundational buildings that is going to lead eventually to skyscrapers all over the world. This is one of the first walls of glass that you will see that is made of glass and steel. But what happens with the Bauhaus is Walter Gropius served in World War I and he was so ashamed and disheartened that the German world had done the kind of destruction that it had during World War I, that he wanted to design a, and develop a school that built up the world. This is why it's called Bauhaus from the German word Bauen, to build. 
Uh, now, what he did here is he and his students uh, and, and teachers built, actually physically built these constructions. This is dormitories for students. These are one of the uh, work um, shops in which they did various things. But what happens with Walter Gropius is though he, he has aspirations to create this kind of industrial school or say a technical school that does industrial design. Um, he desperately wanted to, to do whatever he could for the students, but there were virtually no materials because the German economy was destroyed. Because the German economy was destroyed, one of the things that they had ample amounts of is what were the leftovers of World War I. And what were the leftovers of World War I were thousands of, of miles, we could say, of tubing. It was tubing was used to put up tents and the, 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 the tents were made of canvas. So one of the first iterations of this, these designs, which are all made of the most simple materials, we don't even see any kind of wood here, we don't see anything. This is, this is a kind of a, a laminated wood, which is sort of a fake wood with a laminate on top just to make it look woody. <laughs> but what we see that is happening here is because there's virtually nothing with which to design, they have to be incredibly creative. And fortunately, they do have some of the most talented teachers that are going to be part of the uh, professors and other technicians that are going to teach at the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus quite often didn't even use capital letters because they thought everybody should be equal. So oftentimes when you see uh, Bauhaus written, th their letters are all in lowercase. But what we have here is a group of teachers who are also following some spiritual leaders at this time. You might have heard of the spiritual leader Gurdjieff uh, and, and, and others that were prominent at this time because there was a big spiritualist movement going on that was helping people deal with the realities of life like mass warfare. Now, Johannes Itten, who we see here, did dress like a monk and shaved his head. And uh, in, in future years, what, um, what will happen with Kandinsky is he's going to write a, a pamphlet on the spiritual and art, which is going to be incredibly significant for modern artists. But what, what we see here that is so important is we see a new style professor. They are not the kind of professors that are interested in teaching you about art history. They're far more interested in teaching you a mindset. And a mindset in modern art, which is geometric and which has the use of uh, quite often primary colors, are what uh, they are teaching these young students to think about life in a completely different way and to not be concerned with ancient history. Many of the things that were made by the Bauhaus are going to be made when there are better times and there's actual wood or pressed wood that you can use a veneer on, or they can make even these kind of minimal pieces of furniture, they will do so. But this, uh, you know, this is connected to the years where the school only lasted for about 14 years. Uh, what they had to do was they had to make these kind of designs according to the dyes that they could get according to the materials that they could get. But more often than not, everything was absolutely minimalistic because that's all they had. So what we see that is happening here is you have to take your creativity absolutely to the highest level. If you have virtually nothing with which to design, you have angle iron in this case to design, then you will come up with some solutions by using the most inexpensive things, very thin doors that might be laminates, and you're going to use paint to make it look that much more attractive. And you can see the back, there's no even back here. There's not enough material to make a backing. During World War I, and even prior to it and after it, there was a big interest 
in coming up with man-made materials that would be inexpensive. The world's population was growing. People wanted to have more things, but they couldn't afford to have many luxury items. So this is the kind of, instead of having expensive silver, they were using stainless steel, or they used metals in which they had a chrome plating, and then they started to use plastics until today, there's no end to the amount of use of plastics. Now at the Bauhaus, there happened to be a very talented woman that was interested in this kind of industrial design. So these are some of the products that were turned out uh, by the Bauhaus students. And this became known, as I said, uh, uh, as industrial design. And it had this clean and sleek line. It represented the machine age and didn't look down upon the fact that you could uh, maybe not have something as decorative as this was, but these kind of objects could be made by machines, turned out quickly, you could mass produce them. And frankly, this didn't even go with anything that was being proposed as a lifestyle at this juncture. The time of Art Nouveau and the time of having these kind of expensive uh, decorative architectural elements in a home were over. The first uh, time in, in, in um, the first few things that the Bauhaus produced were these kind of door handles that were made of unattractive metals that would, uh, you know, uh, kind of turn in color. Uh, and then they started putting chrome on them so that they would shine. Well, these, these were answers to problems. Uh, designers, architects are always coming up with answers to problems. How do you make a tea infuser that is not made of this decorative, you know, labor hours of work that are required here, but the kind of thing that, that you can buy even today, say it for $2.99 at TJ Maxx. The other thing that was an important contribution that the a Bauhaus made was they came up with the concept of a prefabricated house. And these prefabricated houses would be delivered to you. The, the, the four sides and the, you know, this additional kind of, kind of skyline here, skylight, an additional loft area. Uh, the windows and the doors would all be delivered and they would be assembled. And one of the first houses like this that was assembled was uh, assembled in, in a man's uh, house, I think backyard, his name was Horn perhaps. And this house on Horn became known as a place where you could go shop for a prefabricated house and you could purchase one like it and it would be delivered to you. Well, this eventually led to the idea that you can build homes out of concrete and um, depending on how much money you could make a design, say, you know, rounded edges and, and so on, because this obviously is going to require more labor hours than that. And um, then there's this interest in what you can build with concrete and how you can make just a charming space with fewer materials and less expensive materials. This is one of the reasons that uh, Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe, who we, we, we will discuss in just a moment, and Walter Gropius, uh, they will, Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius are going to end up in the United States. Le Corbusier is going to stay in France, but they were all connected with the Bauhaus and the Bauhaus aesthetic and design. So this is one of the reasons that you see the home that he built for himself. He built a home for himself in which he began to look at the house as a working machine. And consequently, on this working machine, um, you had virtually no art inside it. I will discuss this building too at some point uh, in, in other lectures, but it's really interesting to see what he does because it was a home that you could clean very easily. You literally turned your hose on the floor and wash the floors with the water with a water hose, and um, everything was was done in concrete, glass, and steel. 
So it is a futuristic kind of house and it's a house that's easy to maintain and also uh, no fuss, no muss kind of thing. You look outside your window, who needs art on your windows? Art is outside the window there and every day it's different. Now Art Deco got its name from a, an exposition that took place in 1925 in Paris. This was, we've seen many expos now over the months that uh, every exposition has one thing in common. It is designed and people go to great expense so that they can generate business for their country. So what happens here in October, uh, well, actually this was held at April to October, 1925, in which the people that wanted to participate were told that you can't see anything here. You will not be able to display anything here that has connection to the ancient world. It all has to be ultra modern. And these kind of buildings, went up there were you know pretend buildings that were taken down uh six months after or five or six months after they were put up but uh, what what people began to see now that was quite amazing is that this simplified style of living was a radical and different way to live uh, though the pavilions, there, there was British and Italian and Belgian, Netherlands from various countries. Actually, the United States did not participate in this exposition. But the countries that were paying for these buildings to go up wanted to generate import and export opportunities. And uh, quite a few of these buildings were paid by major department stores like the Printemps um, associated uh, stores and the uh, Galleries Lafayette, they were paying for these constructions because inside they were showing people how they could live in the most elegant way and they could obviously purchase these items in their stores, but it was showing people that you can uh, make beautiful, things with simplified lines. Well, this goes really very nicely along with abstract art, because at this time, abstracted art is two dimensional and flat, but can coordinate very nicely with what is going on. Even those these materials are all relatively new. They're laminates of various kinds. Um, they're bold. They're, they're still inspired by nature, but they're made geometric. So these kinds of things that would have been on exhibition in those various pavilions were showing you that though you, if you have a lot of money, you can live in a home that's elegant like this. And if you have less money, you can still have this kind of influence in something that is not quite as expensive. All of these various coordinated uh, tableware and uh, uh, radiator grills or, uh, you know, women's compacts or clocks, anything that you used in the home at this time could be made less expensive with these new materials. And some of the fabrics that would have been nicely coordinated with all this are also using all of these geometric styles, <clears throat> though we can see that they too are nature inspired. In this building, what we see is that there are some kind of scalloped, there's a scallop look here that looks a little bit like a wedding cake. And one of the reasons that this design was appropriated here is because the 1920s, the Mexican Revolution was over and Diego Rivera came back from Paris to start painting on the walls of the National Palace. And uh, there, there was uh, all kinds of talk and um, publicity around what Diego Rivera was doing, which brought a lot of attention to the um, Aztec culture in Mexico and consequently um, other 
designers and architects were taking some influence from that kind of stair-step design. It's not the only reason that they did it, because when these kind of buildings were going up, uh, though they, at this point, they look kind of more like a wedding cake, uh, in, in uh, future years, when buildings go up next to each other, the, the, the sunlight will not be able to reach the streets. They'll be creating these dark tombs on the streets. So um, step back laws will be instituted so that the building can become narrower as it goes up and consequently more light will reach the streets. But this is the Fisher Building in Detroit, uh, which was one of the first buildings, 1928, that was Art Deco in style, which is to say that it was highly simplified and repeat designs, repeat, repeat, repeat. And the street level is where all the goodies are going to be. That's where all the decoration is going to be. Still in all, we can see these combinations of ideas of these metals uh, that are being used and this, this interest in uh, the Aztec world or the Mayan world. And uh, it has these correlations here. Now, in 1922, after King Tut's tomb was being excavated, and during that time, the, the gold, the effect of all this gold uh, and the interest in these Egyptian motifs became a very big thing in uh, the Western world. So that quite often what you saw when you went into buildings was this reflection of gold. You were going into this uh, new building, which was Art Deco in style, but it was going to have the same richness as King Tut's tomb. And it is going to have, say, the geometric style, which is prevalent in Art Deco. But at the same time, you have these motifs that are in, in many ways attached to the classical style design. But the Egyptian style went everywhere imaginable. This is in Brussels, Belgium, a Masonic temple, which is usually Christian inspired, but it's interesting that they chose this as the interior. And then uh, these kind of Egyptian style movie theaters. There's one in LA as well, not only the Chinese, but Egyptian style. And this is sort of a Lollapalooza of this celebration of all things uh, from that part of the world. The Guardian building, which I could not believe I was looking at, it took my breath away. The Guardian building at the street level, which was what you see here, has these Egyptian motifs and kind of style it. It might be a little Aztec and Mayan as well, but it has certainly this, um, these exotic culture additions and motifs. Uh, is Art Deco inspired at the top. But most of this building then is the repeat designs that would be possible when you make something with machine tooling. And then when you go into the building, this is what you see. This is a uh, something that you can't believe you're looking at. What, what kind of work it, it took to do this kind of thing. So this is... Um, the 1920s between World War I and World War II. What we know that happened for America that was such a significant moment was that we became the skyscraper capital of the world, the empire state. Uh, and what we see here is this is not done just because of step back laws. As I said, there will be step back laws because of the concentration of buildings. But what we have here are very tall buildings that have to be supported at the bottom. So you have to make this wider base so that the building can continue to grow and it gets more and more narrow as it goes up because of the weight of these buildings. We'll see how architects come up with ideas to use space here, because what's happening when you make this base wide, if this base could continue to go up like a box, you could have maybe a hundred more spaces to rent. And these kind of buildings are so exorbitant 
that you have to rent whatever space you possibly can. We'll see in a few moments how they solve that problem. What happens here is that skyscrapers become a must uh, in the um, expensive world of downtown city centers. If you can buy a small plot of land and build up, you don't have to pay for anything but that small plot of land. You don't have to pay for airspace. So the consequence of these buildings going up in the way that they will is initially to save money on real estate. But at the same time, uh, because you could replicate these materials and you could put them up like a jigsaw puzzle, you could put them up like a Lego building, then uh, they began to be feasible. But everything you know, from the ground level had to be as simple as possible. And what you rented here as a tenant was simply the box and you had to pay for uh, the build out. As we know, the Empire State Building became super famous because of King Kong. And the architect said that he was inspired by a number, number two pencil. Well, uh, this is what happens at the street level. At the street level with Art Nouveau, these kinds of things were all handmade individually for one building alone. In this situation, it's considerably different. And one of the ways that you could make someone feel like they were walking into a space that was very rich was by inviting them to a building that glistened and glowed before you even got through the front doors. Uh, additionally, you would walk into the foyer, which had this kind of, again, this feeling that the Fisher Building and that the Guardian Building have, and that is that if you are going to pay top dollar for rent in a building like this, the people that are going to come and do business with you first have to see that this place is just dripping with wealth and dripping with success. So this is the reason why all the money went there. The, it, the, the other thing that we know is that this use of metals was used everywhere and because Chrysler manufactured cars and they used kind of this hubcap design at the very top, but it also added this gleaming effect that you would see in the sunlight. But as tradition dictates, many uh, ar architects are still influenced by the ancient world. So sure enough, they put these gargoyles on the, um, on the Chrysler building and they were the gargoyles that were equivalent to the Notre Dame and Margaret Burke White, who we will discuss when we talk about photojournalism, had to have an apartment right behind this gargoyle so she could take herself outdoors and make photographs of New York City. What she was interested in photographing were all the high rises that were going up everywhere. That was the only place that you could get a good shot of them is literally high up in the air. So we know at this time that Rockefeller Center was a jobs program that created work during the depression and it is a classic art deco. This uh, love for all things deco and high rise started to be uh, you know, replicated in furnishings and design. And everywhere you looked, there were skyscrapers. Skyscrapers with girls on them, all kinds of beautiful shiny materials that were available everywhere. And then because of the um, materials that were being developed, they could make cellulose films and everything was designed so that it shimmered off the screen. These very simple shapes that you see that are being kind of replicated here and, 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 and you see the reflection of in the water uh, was that kind of this simple geometry gave all of these uh, set designs very special kind of elegance because you were focused on certain things. There wasn't a lot to distract you. Radio City Music Hall became this foundational moment in which America was showing the world that we can have great entertainments, we can have very large halls, we can have simple buildings that have these kind of simple motifs on them, 
that still replicate in the same way that buildings before would have made these motifs that celebrate dance and drama and music. You can even have this sort of starburst design, which became a very big part of Art Deco in this very large um, space in which there was entertainment for some 6,000 people. And America became not only sort of a, a, a interest around the, the show place that was taking place in Radio City Music Hall, but uh, a place that was uh, absolutely the end, you know, kind of the be all and end all in innovation. Now, one of the ways that the, these kind of buildings, as we said, are made more warm inside because if you walk into a building that has very little adornment, then the, the uh, I guess the way that you make this enchanting and engaging is by using warm colors and these kind of decorative elements that sometimes can just be uh, punched uh, or, or pressed out with materials uh, that come in rolls. Something that is not hand done but is something that can, can be replicated in machines as well. Donald Desky is the American interior designer that started to uh, create these kind of warm interiors. This is what you see in uh, Radio City Music Hall and in, in the Rockefeller Center. And um, it, was, it was a way to make a gleaming world using less expensive materials in many cases and also all kinds of wood designs and, uh, and shiny things, basically. Making things that look like they were shining with lots and lots of lacquer and lots of um, motifs that were painted gold. One of the things that happens at the Art Deco period is that turquoise and gold and turquoise and orange were used in many places. So here we see, uh, this is the East Columbia building in Los Angeles. They're not only using and replicating these kind of motifs that are generated by machines, but they're giving you the lovely shining doors. Now I asked an architect friend of mine, which building is uh, one of the buildings that is known uh, in the architectural world as a building that the architect should have stopped before he started to just make a hodgepodge of a building that threw in everything that has ever been invented by mankind. And he said, I would have to say, it's the City Hall in Buffalo, New York. A couple of years ago, I went to see this building. I had to see this building. And it is exactly, I think, what this architect friend of mine said. For one thing, you can see that the building has these replicated forms which would go up like a lego building you know one thing after another um and then uh, you also see that in this this friend of mine said that if you have to be careful walking in front of this building at night because it looks like a huge dog sitting on its haunches that's getting ready to pounce on you well what I noticed was that what you have here is an obelisk, which commemorates uh, the life of McKinley. I believe it was President McKinley that was assassinated here, if I'm not wrong. So we have an obelisk here in honor of McKinley in front of a building that connects it to the Egyptian world, right? So this is one of the reasons that on the mall in Washington, we connect ourselves to the Greco-Roman world and to the Egyptian world. Washington's monument is an obelisk related to that. So we, this is what we see that is happening in Buffalo, New York. In addition to that, what you have is, as you come into the building, you see a replica of the Parthenon with its bas-reliefs that are associated more with American history, but certainly we can see these Corinthian columns there, representational of that. And here's a bigger picture. At the top of the building, we have this Art Deco styling, which we saw moments before in Detroit. And in addition to that, uh, we 
are going to see sort of a replica that is moving toward a dome. It is somewhat looking like the shape of a dome, which could be connection to the Roman dome. Where the uh, city council meets, uh, or probably the, the state, the, yeah, I guess this is the, the capital, so the state uh, representatives, senators, and so on representatives meet here, we see more of an Art Deco style, and we have this motif that is the sunburst Art Deco uh, skylight. Now, what do we have when we walk into the building? It's hard to get a really good picture of this. There are lots of, there's lots of mosaic work all around this area. But as we said, the, uh, the floor level, where you come in, the street level, um, there is expensive beyond measure. There's expensive, expensive. I think the, the more color that marble has, I think the more expensive it is. I'm not exactly sure about that. But certainly what we see is extraordinary amounts of expensive marble and materials. Now, this changes every hour of the day. The colors change here, not so dramatically as this, but because there's light that that's coming in from four sides, so it changes color. So let's look at it when it, this is one part of the day where it looks very yellow. Now, so what, it, what do we see here that is happening? If you remember, when the reason that I brought this up again is because that this, we see that this young woman is pregnant with new ideas. And what we see here that is pretty astonishing is that we see a woman warrior figure, and this is the way your stomach looks after you've given birth to a baby. And if you're lucky, it goes back in place. But this is what you look like. So it, are we being told that she has given birth to a lot of new ideas? Because the other things that we see here is she has very little, say, breast tissue. It's her armament there, the breastplate, is lying very close to her chest in the way that a Roman warrior's would be. We see the, this kind of combination of cherubs, which comes from the Italian world, the putti, the baby angels. Then we see the age of industrialization, the age of air travel, and the age of steel making. We're honoring the American Indian who is bringing the grains and those people that do the backbreaking work that are building something like the Empire State Building, those people that do the very hard labor. And then she is sitting here, interesting that she's not standing. She is sitting here. Now, why has the choice been made that she is sitting there? Now, we discussed this in other lectures that the Greek world determined who should sit and who should stand. So we know that Zeus is the adjudicator of justice on planet Earth, and consequently he sits because he must make decisions. And so judges and people that are philosophers and people that uh, are the ones that give the laws, that determine what the laws will be, they sit. Whereas we saw in this case, she stands. She stands because she probably stands for liberty. And she certainly stands for a hero that has won the Olympics match. So we can see that there are these connotations that are taking place here that are being absorbed into this mural for a very good reason. The other thing that we see that is quite interesting is this halo effect that we see around her probably from the work of Alphonse Mucha. So Alphonse Mucha makes the average woman into a deity because he gives her a halo. And we see that she has a halo as well. But, but inside this halo, we see Medusa. Isn't it Medusa that has the snakes? Isn't she a gargon or something like that in Greek mythology? So we see all these snakes. Well, to say that you are slightly flummoxed at looking at this scenario would be an understatement, 
but it, 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 it is certainly, uh, if, if we want to be kind, a celebration of everything that has ever come to mind in, in anyone's heart as to what should be used uh, as a way of defining this cultural landscape of this piece of architecture. And during World War I and World War II is where we start to get a lot of interest in the age of transportation and the age of speed. Now, it's, it's quite interesting how all this happens uh, because we get the, you know, travel, this intercontinental travel and uh, the potential to fly airplanes and to go very, very fast in trains. As it happens, the design elements in this really spoke for what people were trying to achieve. Although in general, when these kind of uh, trains started to look more streamlined, or these boxy cars started to look more aerodynamic, they did not go any faster than they had gone before. But it was just a way of expressing something that you were maybe even trying to move faster through this century that was producing so many innovations. And uh, of course, the airplane was something that uh, no one could get enough of this age of aviation became such an exciting moment that uh, even this design that you see uh, in a filling station is something that is adopted from there. But one thing you might notice is the advertisements, almost always the advertisements, irrespective of where they were being made, say if it was the French airlines or American airlines or trains, they were all going to make their way to New York. They're almost always showing you that they're making their way to New York because New York is the ultimate in all things new and ingenuity that was taking place in the United States. But this interest in intercontinental travel uh, started to inspire uh, architects to design homes or apartments that looked like a big, uh, a ship that was parked on the streets. It looked like there were ocean going cruise ships that were parked on the streets. That's what these buildings look like. Here are more of them. Uh, but what you can see that is happening here that is really amazing is this is the BBC company before we have television. These are their offices for the purpose of their, uh, radio programs at this time. And the transmission tower in the back looks like a big cruise ship that is parked on the street. It's behind this building. So this, this became known as a kind of a subcategory as Art Deco Modern. This, it, and, it, and it was embracing streamlined technology and aviation and you know, some, some interest around uh, even skyscrapers. The women's roles in society that we touched on last time, when we see here the photography of Edward Steich, and he's making this in 1907, and just three years before, there were still women that were very concerned about uh, appearing appropriately in public. And young women were becoming more and more liberated uh, so that they were smoking and wearing loose fitting clothing and everything we, we made kind of this association with this almost looking like a snake last time that if you don't like this woman's attitude toward life, she thinks time's a wasting and she's going to live it up and she could care less what you think. But it's not just that women were looking more powerful women were able to determine their fate once they got the vote. They were able to determine their fate in a much bigger way than they ever had before. So what we begin to see is maybe we can say women started to get a leg up on their future. This is perhaps one of the reasons why you started to see women's legs for the first time in history. And you started to see the kind of designs that were not only shimmery, as we said, but uh, this happens to be Peggy Guggenheim that is wearing a Paul Poiret dress uh, in which kind of this new flapper era uh, presents opportunities in which women don't have to hide their body anymore, but
but you can be uh, proud of the simplicity and the elongated styles that the dress will permit you to, um, to acquire this kind of silhouette. When women started to get more opportunities, they started to take them. So in the 1920s, 1930s, this interwar era, uh, we know that women started to get a lot of attention for being athletes. And this is uh, Helen Klankovich who was um, doing these kind of displays at the Sutro Baths in San Francisco. She won a gold medal for her high uh, dive jumps. And she will make her way into the work of Diego Rivera who will uh, probably be in San Francisco when she's doing this. So he will commemorate her forever in these kind of, um, in the San Francisco murals of which he will make three important works there. But the haircut for women in which women were going to look more like men, uh, and this is why their haircut was referred to as a bob, uh, realized that they couldn't do a whole lot with a little bit of hair. So this is where you get this kind of ornamentation that's going to be introduced at this time. And also the cloche hat, it will be a way for you to have something on your head that is more decorative because your hair is simple. So we remember the Art Deco style is a phenomenal moment in history uh, because the simplified style did not mean that you couldn't make elegant interiors. It simply meant that there were other choices that designers would have to make. And they wanted these spaces that accommodated thousands of people every day to look like your living room or to look like a place that was warm and inviting. And consequently, they more often than not use kind of these earth tones. Now, getting back to the problem that was uh, uh, part of the way that architecture had to go up, you had to make this sort of narrowish, uh, more narrow design to support the building. Then when these kind of materials were introduced and these kind of plate glass options became part of how you could design, buildings could go up in these magnificent ways. Uh, not only were they reflecting the sunlight and had other aspects to them that made them attractive, uh, but at the same time, a lot of people thought that the, the death of design was here with these kind of buildings. Still in all, say, when Mies van der Rohe designed this piece, which is in Chicago, I believe. No, the Seagram building might be in New York. No, yeah, 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 it is in New York. The Seagram building is in New York because uh, Philip Johnson is going to design the Four Seasons Bar with this Art Deco design. And uh, they will even include the geometry and the organic aspects of uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright influence into the Four Seasons. This is the bar area. And this was the, this is the eating area. And I, I believe they're either refurbishing it or they closed the Four Seasons. There are about five capitals of Art Deco in the world. And the biggest one is in New Zealand where there are 150 buildings, Art Deco buildings on the coast in Napier, New Zealand. In 1931, there was an earthquake that uh, destroyed the city, absolutely leveled the city. And they have something like 150 buildings that were built there at that time. And this uh, tragedy transformed the city. It's become a place that uh, people come to uh, in, in February to celebrate the buildings and the old um, automobiles and everything having to do with Art Deco. The second largest collection of Art Deco buildings are, is in Mumbai, formerly Bombay. And uh, this, uh, they are, choose these kind of very simple designs and embellish them with Hindu gods and other Indian motifs. And then another place you might not expect to see a large collection of Art Deco buildings is in Spain, Valencia, Spain. Uh, where uh, they just used anything imaginable, lots, lots, lots of various motifs, Egyptian, Mayan, Aztec, 
and uh, simplified deco style as well. Havana, Cuba is known as having a large concentration uh, because they were building up Cuba at this time, celebrating the Spanish colonial period. They were able to kind of throw off the European stronghold on them in the 1920s, Art Deco popular, and so their buildings. But in uh, the North American continent, uh, Miami Beach, South Beach, is the largest concentration that we have of Art Deco districts. And because uh, this South Beach was destroyed by a hurricane uh, in this time period in the 1920s when they started putting these buildings up, uh, and because it was such, uh, so much of it was concentrated in Florida, one of the most used motifs for Art Deco is the palms, the palm trees.